Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking about opioid use disorder in the justice system. Um, my rationale for being able to talk to you about that is that I am an addiction psychiatrist. I treat substance use disorders uh, across the board. I've been working in the drug court system uh, for about the last six or seven years. Um, I just presented last week at the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, very similarly to what I'm talking to you about today. Um, over lunch today, I had the pleasure of meeting some new colleagues uh, from Georgia, Javon Hicks and Troy Thompson. And they reminded me when I started asking them about your organization, about the work that you do, that it's not only defendants or people in, the, in a custody situation who are affected. They reminded me that they work in the um, Lawyers uh, Health Association in their jurisdiction. And it reminded me that I work with impaired physicians in New York and New Jersey. And for you and for me, probably there's no one in this room who doesn't have someone in their family or a loved one who's, effect, who's not affected by addiction in some way. So this is more than just talking about defendants. It's personal for me. It's my work. Um, if you've had a few teenagers die from their addiction in your practice, it will catch your attention. So I want to talk about the history of the uh, opioid crisis, where we, uh, how we got where we are right now, and what I think we should do about it. And I'm going to uh, be presenting some information about uh, the treatment of addiction, uh, of, op of opioid use disorder specifically, and uh, I'm going to be talking about MAT, medication-assisted treatment specifically. Um, I'm going to intentionally leave some time at the end because I'd love to have some discussion, some question and answer about this. Probably not everything I say you're going to agree with, which is fine. That's why we're having this kind of a discussion. Uh, but my goal is to talk to you about opioid use disorder specifically. Um, first of all, what do we mean when we say addiction? And the question often comes up, well, how do you know the guy's addicted? How do you know this is a substance use disorder and not just someone misusing a substance? And this is straight from the DSM. And there are a lot of other criteria, but this is the meat of the matter. A substance use disorder describes a problematic pattern of using alcohol or another substance that results in impairment in daily life or noticeable distress. A person with this disorder will often continue to use despite consequences. So this is the obvious, right? Someone who's dependent on a substance, and I'm talking about in the addiction sense, not the physical dependence, someone who's dependent will have impairment in his or her relationships because of it, will have impairment in his or her work situation, in his or her physical health, in his or her schooling. So something bad is happening to the person because of the use of that substance. Um, we're moving away from physical dependence. It's not just that the person has withdrawal from the substance. It's not just that the person needs more of the substance to get the same high or gets less of a high from the same amount of the substance. That's tolerance. Those are physical phenomena actually unrelated to what we call a substance use disorder. If you want to think about it even more simply, to think about it for yourself or friends or family or someone you think might have a problem, if the substance use affects the person's ability to live, laugh, love, and learn, someone taught me this mnemonic, they have a problem with the substance. So we don't look anymore about how much they're using, if it's legal or not legal, what time of day they use it, if they drink with other people or not. The important thing is whether it's harming them in some way. You've probably all seen these data on opioid overdose deaths in the United States. You can see the startling increase since 2000, uh, up to 47,000 deaths from any opioid in uh, 2017. Um, I think if you read the newspapers, if you are at all aware of what's happening in the addiction world, uh, you've, you know about this increase in opioid deaths. Uh, importantly, there have been several waves in this uh, current opioid uh, crisis. Uh, the first was an increase in Prescription opioid drugs, for all the reasons you're aware of, uh, they were being overprescribed, uh, sometimes for the wrong indications, and people were becoming dependent upon them. Um, the DEA and other organizations rightly cracked down on the overprescription of opioid uh, drugs, and they somewhat effectively decreased the supply of prescription opioid drugs available, which unfortunately sent the people who were dependent on opioids to the heroin dealers because the heroin was both less expensive and more available and more potent than the prescription opioid drugs. Then we got an increase in heroin deaths starting in about uh, 2000. More recently, over the last four or five years, we have had the unfortunate experience of uh, people who are illicitly selling heroin, mixing it with potent uh, opioids like fentanyl. So we've had a, a mass, of, of in, mass increase in deaths related to fentanyl and other potent opioids. We could discuss why they cut it with fentanyl if you want to at the end, uh, but it's not a pleasant story. In any case, those are the three um, waves of the present opioid use disorder that we have 
epidemic that we have recently. So I want to talk to you specifically about some things that are happening in 2019 uh, with opioid use disorder and its treatment. One is there's uh, changing drug use, as I told you. There are, there are actually fewer and fewer prescription opioids available, and notwithstanding the fact that people can still get them and people die from overdose from prescription opioids. Um, there's much more heroin available than there was even five years ago. Uh, there are all kinds of adjuncts or different drugs that people are using, like Kratom. Who here has heard of Kratom? A lot, okay. Kratom is a uh, herbal supplement. People make it into a tea. In all but four states, it's legal, my understanding, at least of a few months ago. Um, you can order it on the internet. Uh, I was down in Florida this, this last year. I was trying to buy something at a gas station, and this was right by the register. It's Kratom. And it's a plant called Meturgna, and it, in fact, is a weak opioid, and uh, patients will sometimes use it to detoxify themselves from opioids. Not a bad idea, actually. But like any other opioid, you will become dependent on it if you use it enough. So I think it's going to be banned across the country, but this is something that's changing pretty rapidly. The other the good news is that there's a lot more funding and there's a lot more federal, at least, support for the treatment of substance use disorders in general and opioid use disorders specifically, which is great. There's a lot of, you know, from my perspective in the American Academy of Addiction and Psychiatry, there's a lot of funding available both for treatment and research. The bad news is, as you're probably well aware, it's hard still to find good treatment for opioid use disorders. The money is not going to probably where it should be all the time. So um, many jurisdictions have difficulty when they identify someone with opioid use disorder getting that person to good treatment. And um, again, that's a fact. I can talk about the ways that the field is trying to deal with that if you'd like to at the end, but it's certainly a fact. Um, there are also still disputes of what, about what constitutes good treatment for opioid use disorder specifically. And I'm going to argue that medication-assisted treatment is the standard of care for treating that particular illness. And I'm not saying that it's the only treatment, and I'm certainly not saying that it's a treatment for, for everybody. Like all medical conditions, a person needs a specific assessment of their problems to see which treatment is better for them. But in general, it's a standard of care. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about brain science. I'm going to make the point that in many ways, substance use disorder and specifically opioid use disorder are physiologic brain conditions. They're not moral issues. They're not issues of uh, uh, poor willpower. Um, they're brain diseases which are affected by psychosocial phenomena. So why do we have this? Everyone, all of us have natural endorphins in our bodies. There are receptors in the brain that those natural endorphins will kick into. It's postulated, that's why people get a runner's high. They have excess of endorphins, they feel pretty good. Um, endorphins decrease pain, they slow breathing, they provide a sense of emotional calm. The same thing heroin does. It's just heroin is many, many, many times more potent than endorphins. So what opioids are out there? Illicit opioids in this country, heroin, the reality in some countries is that there's, there's prescribed heroin. Uh, Britain has a program. Uh, Canada has a program for prescribed heroin. We could talk about why that is and the pros and cons of that if you'd like. There are prescription pain relievers out there. You all know the names, hydrocodone, oxycodone, names, Percocet, Vicodin, um, fentanyl, um, and all of those are prescription pain relievers. And I think a, a mistake we have made in the field often is saying that these prescription pain relievers are evil. They're not. If you fracture your femur in a motor vehicle accident, you should get morphine. If you have an operation, you maybe need two or three days of opioid medications. And so I've been around long enough to see the pendulum swing, swing back and forth from not enough opioid being prescribed to over the last 20 years, too much opioid being prescribed because it's, we, we realized we weren't treating some pain and having to go back and forth over the years. So there are certainly indications for someone getting an opioid medication, one of these prescription pain relievers. The problem is that on the order of 5 to 10 percent of people who get those medications are going to be vulnerable to addiction and will likely become dependent on those medications. So that's why they have to be carefully managed. Um, Another opioid, and I'm going to talk in more depth about these, uh, methadone and buprenorphine. Um, these are two opioid medications which are used to treat opioid addiction. It's a little weird, but I'll explain why that works. Um, but these are genuine opioids also. They can be used for pain control also. So how do opioids uh, cause addiction? The same way other drugs cause addiction, just a little bit more powerfully. They disrupt the reward system, they bind, they bind to mu opioid receptors, and they flood the brain with dopamine. So this is a mu opioid receptor in your brain. Morphine fits right into it. Endorphins fit into it. Um, hydrocodone fits into it. Oxycodone fits into it. 
like lock in a key, and when you stop using that opioid medication, you will have some withdrawal. Every 75-year-old person who goes into the hospital with a hip fracture gets some opioids in the hospital. The surgeon says, listen, when you go home, you're going to not be on opioids anymore. Motrin's fine. You're going to feel a little weird. You can have a little flu over a few days. Don't worry about it. It's just the opioid coming out of your body. It's withdrawal. Okay, but no one calls it that. No one calls the 75-year-old person uh, an addict or dependent on that drug. They're having withdrawal, physical withdrawal. So everyone who stops an opioid abruptly will have... Uh, opioid withdrawal. Opioid withdrawal, unlike alcohol withdrawal, is not usually dangerous. Opioid withdrawal consists of runny eyes, runny nose, muscle cramps, goosebumps, that's why they call it cold turkey because you have goosebumps on your hand, um, craving, diarrhea, it feels terrible. Um, and I would argue that it's cruel to allow someone to go through that, that uh, opioid withdrawal, but it's not of itself dangerous usually. So what can you do about someone who's got an addiction and specifically an opioid use disorder. And I'm going to start with the non-medication treatments. I meant to anyway. There we go. The psychosocial approaches to addiction. So what are the psychosocial approaches to addiction? One is Narcotics Anonymous. Um, and everyone here has heard of AA and NA, and I'm a, a big proponent of NA and AA. I think they're very productive. Um, I think also that they're an adjunct to treatment. Narcotics Anonymous is not treatment, nor do they claim to be treatment. They claim to be a peer support group for people trying to stop using opioids. And um, I recommend everyone try AA or NA uh, out of the gate because I like the peer support that they give. Um, sometimes, not always, but sometimes they'll give the message you shouldn't be taking these uh, medications. If you go to an NA meeting or an AA meeting, they might say, well, you shouldn't be taking these medications because they're mind-altering substance. And the reason they say that is some people in those groups have had bad experiences with doctors prescribing medications, like trying to cure alcoholism with Valium. It does not work because the person gets dependent on, on Valium. Or giving overprescribing uh, opioid medications. It's not the official view of AA or NA that, that people should or should not take medications. In fact, I have on my shelf pamphlets from AA which say we have no opinion about medications that are, specific, that are appropriately prescribed to you. So, I recommend everyone go to NA or AA. Other uh, peer-reviewed effective treatments for substance use disorders, things like most motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, family structural therapy, contingency management strategies, where people are paid for negative urines. These are all effective, um, but they are not the mainstay. They're not the standard of care for opioid use disorders. When I started talking about how we treat substance use disorders. I, I've been adding something recently because I think it's really important. We're, we're at an inflection point in the addiction treatment world right now about how we talk about what we're doing. Judge Nakamura was very careful to say substance use disorders. She didn't say addiction once. And I think that should be the model of what we all do. And I'm trying because we don't want to label people uh, as being bad, wrong, not even trying. When I go to my internist, my blood pressure's up a little bit because I didn't do what he told me to do. He doesn't say, don't ever come back to my office again. You're not even trying. No. He tries to fix my medication regimen. He tries to fix my diet, my medication, whatever it is that he needs to do. And we look at it as a medical problem rather than some moral failing on the person's part. Um, when I started out in treatment, I certainly said, so-and-so uh, had a dirty urine last week. We don't say that anymore for obvious reasons. We, we say what we would say in any other illness. We say the person's sample was positive for opioids. That's a description of the fact rather than a moral attack on the person who had the positive. We don't say clean urines anymore. We say negative. Um, I don't call substitution therapy with MAT. I'll talk about it more. I don't call it substitution therapy. I call it medication therapy. I'm not really substituting one drug for another. Well, that's often the, the concern. Um, if you really want to sound smart, you don't say the person is non-compliant with treatment. You say he's expressing ambivalence about change. It's the same thing, I know. But, but actually, in all seriousness, it does tell us exactly what the most important thing going on is. <coughs> in the treatment world, we don't say recidivist. I understand that's a legal term that you use often in the courts. Um, we try to avoid that. <coughs> Who here, who here has heard of Narcan? Okay. I want to address that. Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold here. <clears throat> a 
Narcan is a very short-acting <clears throat> opioid antagonist. It blocks the uh, opioid receptor. So if this is the opioid receptor in the brain, which I told you about, <clears throat> heroin hits it, uh, morphine hits it. Uh, what, na what naloxone does is it knocks that off the receptor. So if someone in front of you is having an opioid overdose, they're not breathing, a shot of Narcan will uh, immediately revive the person um, from their opioid overdose. Does anyone know if uh, EMS and uh, police officers in your ju jurisdiction carry Narcan with them? Yeah, okay, good. So they certainly do where I live, and it's a very good thing. No one really argues about Narcan, <clears throat> although actually some people do, but very few do. <clears throat> I want to talk about, in contrast to Narcan, I want to talk about the, the medications that are used for maintenance treatment of addiction. Uh, there are three FDA-approved medications for treating opioid use disorder. One is methadone, one is buprenorphine, and one is naltrexone. Has everyone heard of those medications? Okay. So I'm going to again talk about those medications specifically, and I think how we should think about them and get them into the justice system. Um, these are the medications for the treatment, maintenance treatment of opioid use disorder. Methadone is an opioid agonist, which means, <coughs> excuse me, which means it hits the receptor. Um, it can only be prescribed in a federally sanctioned clinic. I can't prescribe it in my office. It can be prescribed in a clinic that's got a license, or it can be prescribed in a hospital. Um, buprenorphine. It's a little complicated. If this is the opioid receptor, buprenorphine hits it and engages with it, but doesn't activate it as strongly as heroin or, or methadone. So, <coughs> If someone has never taken buprenorphine before, they'll probably get high if they take it. If they take enough of it, they'll get sedated. There is a ceiling effect on it, which means that even if you take a massive overdose of buprenorphine, you're unlikely to have an opioid overdose because when you get to the high levels, it doesn't work as well. <coughs> um, the caveat there is that if you take buprenorphine with another central nervous system depressant, like Valium or like alcohol, you could have a overdose with the buprenorphine. Um, naltrexone is a long-acting naloxone, so it knocks opioid off the receptor and it covers the receptor. So if someone takes naloxone and there's an injection for this, if you block that receptor, what will happen if the person takes morphine after that or heroin? Exactly. If, you, if the receptor is blocked, they won't get any uh, response to the opioid drug. They can still take the opioid drug, but they will have wasted their money on the opioid. Um, it sounds like a perfect treatment. It really isn't any more than any of these are perfect treatments. Um, so, and, and naltrexone can be prescribed by any physician with a, with a medical license in that state. Um, <clears throat> what about diversion? Um, there is a moderate risk of diversion with methadone. If you are, uh, haven't taken methadone before, you can get high from it. Um, if a child who's, who's, um, uh, has never take, if a child takes methadone, he or she could have a fatal overdose because of the use of that methadone. Um, and it, it, certainly methadone is sold on, sold on the streets. Um, subac buprenorphine, which is the next one, has some but not much potential for diversion. All of my patients say, look, if I was trying to get high, I would not buy buprenorphine on the street. I could get something else. I don't need to use buprenorphine. Um, I would say naltrexone, the injectable naltrexone, which is once a month, has no potential for diversion because it's impossible to get high from naltrexone. It's the opposite of an opioid. Um, same thing with misuse. Methadone, you can misuse it. If someone is, is not tolerant to methadone, they could use it to get high. Um, uh, buprenorphine, as I told you, doesn't have much potential for misuse. Um, the tough part about naltrexone, the last medication, is that you need to have not used any opioid for 7 to 10 days before you start it, which is a very hard place to go for people who are dependent on opioids. Um, same thing with overdose. As I told you, methadone can cause overdose, buprenorphine, very unlikely, naltrexone, impossible. <clears throat> um, so how do clinicians decide about what treatment or what medication is important is, is most useful for the person who's dependent on opioids. And this becomes the crux often in drug courts because um, drug court judges and attorneys rightly want to dig into the guts of how clinicians are making their 
judgments and their assessments, and that's as it should be. Um, so clinicians make their judgments about treatment by looking at prior response, obviously. If someone's done well with a particular treatment or a particular medication, they should probably get that one again. That's not rocket science. They look at the side effect profile. What is it that has bothered this person in the past? What do we worry about bothering this person having in the future? What are the side effects? Um, they look at the uh, patient's occupation. If you're in a safety-sensitive occupation, some of them test for methadone, some of them test for buprenorphine. And that's obviously very person-specific. And um, if someone says, although I'd have a cause for an ADA action if someone tested me for buprenorphine and denied me uh, a uh, employment, no one wants to do that. People just want to get a job and, and have a uh, negative drug test when they start the job. Um, pregnancy or breastfeeding, um, similarly, there, there are uh, large data sets looking at both methadone and buprenorphine during pregnancy and breastfeeding. All of them argue for continuing those medications during pregnancy and breastfeeding because the risk of returning to heroin is so very high. Um, are we worried about physical dependence or not? Finally, patient preference. If someone says, this medication, I really feel good about it, my family doesn't want me to take the other medication, as a clinician, I try to work with the patient. I'm trying to build a therapeutic alliance with that person to try to get them into treatment so they get their, their life compass back together. So I don't ever minimize patient preference. Um, clinicians still have to make a recommendation based on their overall judgment, but you need to listen to what the patient is saying. I, I say this to clinicians. Um, administratively, obviously, in some jurisdictions, only one drug is available. Sometimes none of these are available. Um, a th really important thing for you to think about is whether it's going to be available after discharge from your system, whether it's a prison, jail, parole, probation, whatever it is. If, that's not, if that particular treatment is not going to be available to the person, let's not bother with getting them started while they're in, while they're in your jail or prison, right? Um, the cost of the patient. Again, this varies across jurisdictions, um, but Understanding what Medicaid is going to pay for and not is very important, and that's where I think we need to be in very, being very specific about what treatment is going to work for what patient. Um, similarly, the stigma attached to some medications. Now, I disagree with the stigma that's attached to some of these medications, but I think I have to be aware that it does exist, not only for your clients, but for their families and for their treatment providers. And I try to work with it and talk about it and try to manage it, but that being said, when I'm not talking to a large group, when I'm dealing with an individual person who's got an opioid use disorder, we try to find the thing that's going to work for that person rather than me getting on the soapbox again. Um, so when do people consider medications for substance use disorders? And I'm very careful to say this, that there are some circumstances where use of a substance does not necessitate use of a medication to treat that, including with opioids. Right? I mean, if a 17-year-old has his or her first experience with opioids, comes into your system with a positive urine toxicology for opioids, it doesn't mean they need buprenorphine. It means they need an engagement um, with treatment in some way. So is there a concomitant medical illness? Often with uh, IV drug users, there's um, ongoing uh, heart infections which need to be treated immediately. If they take another opioid by injection, they could endanger themselves immediately. Is there a pregnancy going on? What phase of recovery are, are, are we in? Now, it is true that methadone and buprenorphine can be used for <coughs> um, tapering someone off a drug, too. So if someone needs to be detoxified, these medications can be used for that also. That's really not what I'm talking about today, but it, they certainly can be used that way. <coughs> so what is agonist therapy? Agonist therapy is when the medication you're using hits the receptor, like I told you. It's use of a long-acting medication in the same class, like methadone or buprenorphine. <coughs> it prevents withdrawal. Um, as a clinician, it's a great way to engage with the patient who's in, in misery because he or she is withdrawing from opioids. You can cure that immediately and say, look, let's try to get you to a place where you're able to function on a daily basis and not have to spend your whole day getting heroin or your whole day going doctor shopping having to get pills, but take this medication once a day and going about your business. Um, it is induction of tolerance. So it's true that with methadone and buprenorphine, as I said to you earlier, if you stop that abruptly, you're going to have withdrawal. And that's something people need to understand. And as a clinician, you need to list that in the, in the cons, in the negatives about that. No one wants to have withdrawal. Um, but in the service of treating an opioid use disorder, which is likely to be fatal, that's often acceptable. It's not substituting one addiction for another. And think about what we talked about earlier. 
Defining addiction as someone having impairment from their use of a substance, you're not causing addiction with the, with the medication you're giving, you're causing the opposite of addiction, whatever that is. The, their impairment is resolved. Sometimes, uh, you know, people say, well, you just substitute one drug for another. And my retort to that, <laughs> try to be nice about it, is that, yeah, I yeah, am, right. Only the medication I'm substituting for the heroin is one that's not going to kill the person, right? I mean, it's legal, it's orally available, the person can now go back to his or her life as opposed to having to spend the whole day tracking down heroin and endangering him or herself with injections. So um, I would argue, because addiction is a brain disease, that it's the same as someone being on insulin the rest of your life, you know? No one says, well, you should try to get off that insulin, you know, you big wimp, because, you know... Um, you need to stop it because you've already had it for six months or a year. You should try to do this on your own, you know. Um, and so, so I, I try to work with families and, and uh, people with uh, substance use disorders to try to think about it that way as a chronic illness. That being said, I think it's perfectly reasonable for someone who wants to, to taper off their methadone or their buprenorphine when everything is stable in their life. The data are very clear on people who, who stop um, uh, maintenance medications like methadone or buprenorphine, about 95% relapse within six months. Now, that is the whole population. Some people have taken these medications for two or three years. They're back to a stable job. They're back to their family. They're back to feeling well. Frankly, people forget that the person had a substance use disorder, and they want to stop taking the medication. In that circumstance, tapering off the medication might not be a bad idea. But again, it's patient it's patient by patient. It can't be something that's mandated. Now, we've been working with the um, National Drug Court Group for many years, and um, I have seen a major change in the attitude of the drug courts about uh, medication-assisted treatment. I had many audiences like this one where someone would say, you're just substituting one drug for another, and that we don't want to be getting people high. What about diversion? And uh, by showing some of the data I'm going to show you at the end and, and explaining some of this treatment, um, I think we really brought a lot of people around. Unfortunately, then, some drug courts are saying, well, everyone has to take <laughs> buprenorphine then. Um, but anyway, we're, we're trying to get a patient-by-patient, a client-by-client patient, client assessment. So what does maintenance treatment with methadone look like? What are the benefits? And I think this is the way we should look at all medications, but including the ones I'm talking about. There's a life, and these are database reports. I'm going to show you some references at the end. Um, if you look up the scientific references for what I am telling you, they're overwhelmingly the case. There's lifestyle stabilization, improved health and nutritional status. There's a decrease in criminal behavior. Employment uh, increases. There's obviously a decrease in injection drug use and shared needles. That's all the good stuff. The bad stuff is that, of course, with methadone, overdose is still possible, especially if a child finds it in the refrigerator. Over sedation is possible with methadone. Um, withdrawal will happen if someone stops it abruptly. There are EKG changes, arguably causing some heart problems. Um, there is a potential for diversion with methadone. And I put on there, and I mean it, there's the meaning of maintenance treatment. Some people don't like to think I'm going to be on this medication for the rest of my life. And, and as I told you, although I don't have any problem with it, if the patient has a problem with it, it's something that needs to be talked about and dealt with. And uh, I, I respect patient choice. Sometimes they need to take something else because they don't like the notion of being on something the rest of their life. The other problem with methadone is methadone clinics. If you've ever been to a methadone clinic, uh, you probably wouldn't want to go back. Um, th often they are um, situations where there are uh, other drugs being sold outside. Um, at least in New York, you'll see people doing the nod, which they're, they're intoxicated with opioids and they look like they're going to fall over, but they don't fall over. Um, that is evidence that they, the person who is in that situation, buying other drugs or has the nods, is not getting the right treatment. They're being over-medicated with their methadone or get, they're getting some other um, drug along with it. So that's the case, but I work with a lot of people who just don't want to go to methadone clinics. So that's part of the problem with methadone. What's good about buprenorphine, and I'm going to tell you again, the benefits and the downsides, same thing, lifestyle stabilization, you can be, not, other than Unlike methadone, it can be provided in a doctor's office or a clinic. It's available by prescription. You go up to the pharmacist like any other medication. He gives you your medication. You go home. Um, withdrawal is more easily tolerated. I mean, so you know, um, you know, if, if you look at withdrawal from heroin, it gets really bad over the first probably 8 to 12 hours, keeps getting bad, and then after about two or three days, it goes down like this. Um, 
Buprenorphine and methadone gets bad over the first 24 hours and slowly leaches out over the next 7 to 10 days when people can't sleep, which is miserable. Um, so kind of pays you money, it takes your choice on withdrawal. But the point is there is withdrawal with both buprenorphine and methadone. Um, so withdrawal more easily tolerated, that's a matter of opinion. If you're someone who likes your pain slow and you know, quick, get it over with, it, I guess it's a personal decision. Um, but one physician can treat a patient with many illnesses, like HIV, right? So the effective treatment for IV drug users is their HIV treatment and their drug treatment in the same place. Um, so what are the downsides of buprenorphine, this other medication I told you about? Um, diversion, as I said, I think that the little, not the little, the diversion that's out there is mostly people diverting buprenorphine so they can treat their own drug use, dis substance use disorder. Um, it is possible, but like I said, people don't much like buprenorphine to get high. You will have withdrawal, um, and again, the meaning of maintenance treatment. Some people don't like the idea that you're gonna have to be on this medication for three years or seven years, maybe the rest of your life. Um, what about nal naltrexone? Now there is Vivitrol and several other uh, trade names for a medication called naltrexone, which I told you about, which is injectable. You get it in the butt once a month, it lasts for 30 days. It blocks the receptor. It sounds perfect. And the benefits of it are there's no possibility for withdrawal or physical dependence. There's no diversion, no one gets high. Um, it, uh, you can't impulsively get any effect from using opioids. I've had many patients who have been not using opioids for years and suddenly walk by the spot where they used to use opioids and have picked up again. If you do that while you're taking naltrexone, you'll get no response. It's, when it works, it stabilizes people's lives. It can be prescribed in their doctor's office. Again, you get the prescription, you go to the pharmacist, gives you medication, you go home. What are the downsides? First of all, you have to get an injection every month. Um, also, you have to be not using any opioids for seven to 10 days. Uh, again, the meaning of maintenance treatment. You probably have to be on it for a long time. Um, it does have some side effects, including hepatotoxicity, toxicity to the liver. Um, you have to monitor liver function tests on a regular basis. Not that other, the other medication I told you about don't have potential side effects like that. Obviously, heroin has worse side effects than any of them. Um, a lack of compliance. Um, most people don't like the injections. Most people don't like taking uh, naltrexone. They usually like suboxone and uh, methadone more. That's the patient uh, preference. Um, and I don't think it's that people are getting high from methadone or buprenorphine. Usually people just feel better and more normal um, from taking those medications. But as I said, some people very much prefer to take naltrexone, and those people should get it. Um, so let me talk to you about therapeutic jurisprudence. This is the uh, legal notions upon which the drug courts are based. Uh, the collaboration of the treatment and legal worlds for the benefit of both defendants and society at large. So obviously drug courts are trying to meld therapy of people with mental health issues or with opioid use disorders with uh, uh, a legal aspect of, and potential sanction for any um, use of drugs in, in my sphere, but also for other bad behavior that the uh, court uh, sets for that person. Um, and I, you probably know that very well, and I uh, very well understand that there are some dedicated drug courts and some courts which are pseudo drug courts, which, which do this sort of work, and then some, you know, small uh, at one afternoon a week drug courts. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about how we get MAT into the justice system, including into the drug courts. Um, there, here's the resistance that I've noted over the years. One is it's expensive. It is. Second is concerns about diversion. No person wants to have something that they've recommended or even required for a patient to be diverted and cause more addiction problems in the street. Um, also, that notion that I talked to you about earlier about you're just substituting one drug for another. Um, also, and this is to uh, our shame as clinicians, there's a dearth of prescribers for MAT. Uh, I have had many drug court judges tell me, yeah, I'd love to have someone that prescribe buprenorphine, but there's no one in my county or the next two counties who can prescribe buprenorphine. Um, so what are the best responses and what is the best way to get this into the justice system in general? One is sh showing and having the relevant research to show that although the, the upfront cost of having an MAT in your, in your jurisdiction is relatively high, the benefits as far as less recidivism, increased employment, better health, um, all those things are far outweigh the costs. And, and this is cer <coughs> certainly true nationally, but I well understand that people are looking at this quarter's expenses rather than um, what's happen happening nationally. Um, we have to collaborate. Um, I go around educating uh, drug court personnel about um, 
uh, how these medications work. I think as clinicians, we need to be educated by the justice system about how the justice system works because it, it has to be an integration. And I am comfortable, I have become comfortable actually, as a clinician with uh, my patients being sanctioned for their bad behavior sometimes. That is part of the drug court uh, uh, model. That's why drug courts are effective, right? I mean, there is that notion that, you know, sometimes a slip or a relapse is simply part of the clinical uh, engagement of starting the person. Sometimes a sanction will help. Um, and I'm going to show you a journal uh, which just came out in July, uh, which, which delves into the nitty gritty of these issues very strongly. But I think as uh, drug court personnel need to be uh, educated, we treatment providers need to be educated too as to what you are doing. And I've really enjoyed that part of it because I've learned an enormous amount about the court system and um, I think that kind of integration is what will help in the long term. Um, I want to talk about drug testing. Um, and I, many jurisdictions do drug testing. I do it uh, in a variety of spheres in employment matters. I do it for Major League Baseball and, and I've learned a lot of things about it in the employment sphere or in the uh, uh, justice sphere. Um, one is you have you if you're going to recommend drug testing, you have to know what kind of drug testing you're ordering and what the efficacy of it is and how it can be beaten. Obviously, um, are you in home versus office? A little uh, I do uh, every time I have a teenager in my practice, and every time that individual darkens my door, I drug test him or her. It helps with their memory about what they did last night. Um, but in any case, my little drug test, I go to the bat, have them go to the bathroom, they give me a urine sample. I, I test it, and three minutes later I have the answer. And it's great. As a clinician that helps me, um, it's unacceptable in any courtroom. It, it, there's no chain of custody, it's not a forensic test, and it would not stand up in court for very good reasons. What are you testing? Um, most uh, jurisdictions test urine, which is great, um, but it is, you know, uh, there are some issues with that. You know, observed urines are really invasive, um, and, but they're probably the standard of care. Um, can you test blood? Well. Actually, a, blood, a lot of people prefer blood tests, but actually there is a small risk when you do a blood test than anyone. Saliva is great, but there, the scientific basis behind that is not as well um, documented. Um, you can do hair testing. Um, hair testing is great also, but there are significant uh, problems with um, the acceptability of that in a courtroom because of the difficulties with scientific validation of, of people's hair. And it has to do with, the, there has been less uh, research on hair testing, um, different uh, racial types of hair are different, um, people use uh, cleansing solvents which are modestly effective in getting uh, substances out of their hair, um, and also a lot of people get a buzz cut right before they come into the courtroom. Um, so. You know, and, and axillary or pubic hair is not as effective uh, doing hair testing. So there are issues with that. So more than just the specific test you choose, you when you're ordering a drug test or suggesting it, you got to know what the purpose of the test is. In my office, I'm just seeing what that 17-year-old is using, and I'm not. There's no punishment involved. I'm not even calling his parents, but I need to know what that person is doing. He, he or she needs to know. Um, who orders the test? Right? Is it the clinician? Is it the judge? Is it random? Um, is it uh, every time someone walks into the courtroom? Is it every Monday morning? Um, some factories do that, every Monday morning drug test. And in the field, that's called an intelligence test. It's not called a drug test because everybody knows Monday morning we're getting a drug test. Um, who gets the result? In your sphere, in the courtroom, it's really important, right? Because a positive drug test in your sphere could mean the person being incarcerated. It could mean the person losing custody of their child. It could mean all kinds of negative things. So that needs to be crystal clear, not only for you as a, as a court, but for the individuals having that drug test done. People have to knowingly give samples when they're given one, and they have to know what the results are. And I would argue for doing that at the beginning of your uh, interaction with the person rather than right before they give a urine sample. And what happens because of the test? That's what I said. The person needs to know what the, what the result is going to be. Does that result in people refusing to have a uh, test sometimes? Yes. In my field, a refusal to test is a positive drug test. Um, I don't know what's in their system, but there's something there. This is the nightmare scenario. And this is kind of cute, but in real life it's not cute. Uh, this New York Post, I saw 
May 14th. Pregnant mother tests positive for opioids, opiates after eating poppy seed bagel. Uh, it was a crazy setup for a comedy classic. Now it's a real-time nightmare for the mom. This lady ate a poppy seed bagel and then had a positive drug test, and she was in the hospital, and they, they, I think they held her for a couple of days while they made sure that it was a poppy seed bagel. And this, they made a joke that it was like, there was a Seinfeld episode about like this, um, and everything came out fine with this. It's because they failed to do a good drug test in the first place. Any forensic drug test should be able to differentiate poppy from opioids. If you and I get a drug test in a hospital, it doesn't do that. It'll just say positive for opiates, and you could tell your doctor, I had a poppy seed bagel last night, and that's usually the end of it. Um, in a court system where there, someone is going to be directly affected by, their, by a positive drug test, you need to have the kind of drug test that looks for 6-monoacetylmorphine, which will tell you heroin, not heroin. Um, and kinds of other scenarios like that, too. That's why someone who's knowledgeable about drug testing needs to do the drug testing. Although this woman, just, it was a funny story in the newspaper, there have been plenty of stories where people are, are incarcerated, have their parole revoked, have all kinds of negative things happen to them because of a mistaken drug test, not just this one. And I do a lot of drug testing, and even with very good Olympic lab drug testing, mistakes still happen. And you have to recognize that as a drug tester, that what we do is not perfect. On the other hand, if someone has six opioid positives in a row, it's not a lab error, okay? Or, or if someone is in front of you in the courtroom and they're nodding out in the, you know, in the back, it's not a mistake, okay? They're not sleepy. Um, so let's look at a little bit of data. Um, this is one good study. We looked at MAT, that's medication-assisted treatment. That's the three medications I talked about. Um, buprenorphine, methadone, and uh, naltrexone. It looked at 31 trials with more than 5,000 participants. Uh, clearly, buprenorphine was superior to placebo for attention and treatment. That's obvious. People come back to get it. Uh, buprenorphine at greater than 16 milligrams a day suppressed opioid use. This is a good thumbnail for seeing whether the clinician in your courtroom is doing a good job. Buprenorphine at lower than 60 milligrams usually doesn't do much good. And I said that very carefully, because I have patients who are taking eight, and they're doing fine, but that's because of them over time. The vast majority need 16. For methadone, it's probably around 60, 70, or 80. Okay, the nightmare scenario with methadone is someone tries to give as little as possible, thereby only giving the person the side effects, not the good effect from the methadone. Um, methadone is superior than buprenorphine for treatment retention, in these studies at least. They both suppress illicit opioid use. Um, this is, the, this is the table of contents from that journal I told you about. It was just put out by the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. Um, if you go look at their website, they will, um, uh, I was a guest editor of it, they will uh, send you a free copy. They will, you can download it right there. It gets into the nitty gritty of using medications like this in the justice system. It has some great studies about statewide efforts that have been extremely effective in using these medications in the justice system. It gets into which ones are better. Um, it gets into uh, the attitudes of people taking these medications, people who are prescribing these medications, and justice professionals who are working with them and what needs to change. So if you really want to get into the weeds, look at the NADCP website and uh, order this journal for yourself. And they'll mail it to you. I'll come over to your house and read it to you. It's a great journal. Um, so my take home points, and I'd love to have some discussion if, if uh, people are willing to do that, um, are these. The United States is in the middle of an opioid epidemic. Uh, the changes based on legal responses, treatment availability, and drug availability are what I said. And the one that I'm really uncomfortable with is the lack of treatment availability. It's something that we as clinicians are working on, um, but are not where we need to be at this point, frankly. Opioid use disorder is a brain disease. It's not a moral issue. It's not a uh, lack of willpower. Um, there are three FDA medications approved for treatment of opioid use disorder, buprenorphine, methadone, and naltrexone. And I specifically don't want to minimize the other psychosocial treatments that I mentioned to you, but I'm talking about medications as a standard of care today. Um, MAT in the justice system, and there's no question about this, decreases recidivism into courtrooms, it improves treatment retention, it suppresses illicit opioid use, and allows a person with addiction to return to his or her life. Um, and I think my slides are available, but I have a bunch of references here for good studies which, which show all the points I was telling you. If you want to look at some good websites, um, these are some excellent websites for clinicians and non-clinicians to learn about MAT. So I think I'm going to stop there, and I'd love to have discussion or uh, questions or argument about this, uh, what I've been talking about today. So I think there are microphones uh, available if someone has a question they want to address. Oh, thank you, sir.
Uh, you mentioned earlier that you would talk about uh, why drug dealers cut heroin with fentanyl or other synthetic substances. Could you talk about that, please? Yeah. Why do they cut it with fentanyl? Um, one is fentanyl is less, expen more, less expensive than heroin, so there's obvious advantage there. Unfortunately, uh, one of the reasons that uh, drug dealers cut heroin with fentanyl is to kill their clients um, because um, if a drug dealer has a uh, death in, amongst the drugs that he's selling, that particular brand name will have a run on it because all the uh, dependent people uh, assume that it's really good stuff. So we are, um, you know, every time there's a drug death in New York at Bellevue where I teach, we try to convince the newspapers, please don't put the brand name in the newspaper because you're going to really help that drug dealer. Um, and obviously journalists can do what they want to do. But uh, that's one of the really offensive reasons why they cut uh, heroin with fentanyl. about um, medically assisted treatment for adolescents and its effectiveness? Right. It's a good question. What about medically assisted treatment for adolescents? I will say the first thing is that there are relatively few data sets on that um, because, um, you know, people are reluctant to prescribe uh, a maintenance medication for a 15, 16, 17-year-old person. Uh, because of the likelihood they'll need to be on that for a long period of time. I will tell you, though, in the field, best practices um, uh, necessitates doing a very good assessment of that 15, 16, 17 year old and deciding whether they need maintenance treatment or not. And I have had plenty of experience in my own practice and with other people who have prescribed maintenance treatment for a 16 or 17 year old because we've all seen deaths of 16 or 17 year olds. So um, I would say that although you probably are committing that person to several year uh, uh, treatment with a maintenance medication, you're doing a lot better thing than the rolling the dice and, and to see whether they're going to have an overdose or not. Um, you know, I've had 17-year-olds and 16-year-olds who have multiple overdoses and finally we get them on a maintenance medication. <clears throat> so this is one of the really difficult things. You know, with an insufficient data set, um, clinicians need to make a decision. And frankly, in those circumstances, um, if there's a family involved, and there usually is, um, the decision needs to be made with the family. Because with a less than 18-year-old, um, it's even uh, more problematic to prescribe an opioid medication. Um, usually the parents have to be on board also. Um, I would advocate for it if necessary, but I'm, I'm probably even more um, uh, careful when recommending maintenance treatment. But I think it's, it's often a good thing, but needs to be a careful evaluation. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Best I could. <clears throat> I have two questions. Based on one of your slides earlier, you had, it was included in there, maybe I misread it, that pregnant and breastfeeding women are, are they continue their use of the opioid, is that right? And so they would not, they would not be included in this medically assisted treatment pool, is that? Oh, no, I, 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 maybe the okay. slide was, was unclear. It's actually a question uh, that's been answered, asked and answered in, uh, in uh, OBGYN. What do you do if a, uh, woman is, is prescribed a methadone or buprenorphine and they become pregnant or and then they decide to breastfeed. The answer is you keep them on the methadone or the buprenorphine. Um, the reason is the likelihood of a relapse to their drug abuse is so very, very high, you keep them on the medication. Now so people say, well, what happens when the baby is born? Does the baby have withdrawal? The answer is they usually do, actually. And they, you know, there's neonatal abstinence syndrome, and that, that infant will need to be treated. Um, but again, you're looking at the benefits of using a medication, you're looking at the downsides. When I personally do that, I do it in conjunction with the person's OB, with a woman's OBGYN, and usually with the family also, because it's a serious business to have a, a pregnant woman take any medication, including these. But the, the data are very clear. If you don't do it, if you stop someone's buprenorphine or methadone in the midst of a pregnancy, you're doing, you know, harm to both the baby and to the mom. So, you, so the answer is you continue buprenorphine or, or methadone. And the second question I had related to um, the, the potential for relapse while or, or continued recovery, having a challenge with recovery, uh, when you're on this medically assisted treatment, and if someone were to relapse, for instance, on the 30-day plan, and they were to relapse, for instance, at the end of it, and then therefore their, their, I guess, tolerance for the drug, and they were to suddenly take that drug, is there a more of a likelihood for overdose at that time? 
It's a really good question. Um, so you're asking what, at, at the end of 30 days, if the person relapses or slips, what does that mean about the treatment they're getting? Um, it's a good question. The first two, methadone or buprenorphine, if they take an opioid, um, it means they were able, to, over time, it means they were able to get high from it. They're not getting enough methadone or buprenorphine. Their doses would have to be increased. So someone who says, yeah, doc, I took the eight milligrams of buprenorphine, but I, I gave myself a little bump of heroin, it means I wasn't giving them enough buprenorphine. They, they weren't uh, blocked is, is a word for it. Um, so those are the first two. The, the final one, naltrexone, um, I told you, this is the receptor, naltrexone blocks it, so does Narcan. Narcan blocks it for about 20, 25 minutes. Naltrexone, the injectable one, blocks it for about um, 30 days. So what happens if someone takes a massive amount of opioid? You can unblock it if you take about four or five times the amount of opioid that you would usually take. Unfortunately, that will also cause respiratory depression and will cause a serious problem. That's one of the other things I don't like about naltrexone. But um, so that can happen. Um, just to expand on your question, first of all, I like the way you said that. What if someone has a challenge as opposed to being, you know, weak? Um, but if someone has a challenge, what if someone starts using cocaine? What if someone starts using marijuana? What if starts someone starts overusing alcohol, which is a fairly common phenomenon when someone gets one uh, drug of abuse stopped they switch to another one. It's called cross addiction. It's no mystery. Um, and what I usually say to that is buprenorphine or methadone don't treat alcohol problems. They don't treat marijuana problems. Don't treat cocaine problems. So the right response if someone slips to another drug is to get them help for that. It's a different phenomenon. The wrong response is to punish them by stopping their buprenorphine and the methadone because that's the one thing that was working, right? So um, you, you, you want to, you know, Keep them treated with the buprenorphine or methadone and get them into treatment. The good part is they're relatively easy to get into treatment because they're already coming to the clinic every week or every, every month. Um, but So that's a long answer to a short question. Hi. Um, when I was working in specialty courts, um, we would have folks who had a substance use disorder, but they also had legitimate long-term pain issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so if they were placed on methadone, that would tend to help them off of the opioid and also a little bit of the pain management. But what is your position on methadone for long-term pain management? Methadone was developed for pain management, actually. So methadone, like any other opioid, can be used for the treatment of pain. So if there's a circumstance where someone is both has a pain syndrome and has a substance use disorder and they're well treated by, their, by methadone, I think that's fine. As a clinician, that usually needs to be done with a good pain management specialist. I mean, I'm a psychiatrist. I treat the addiction problem. I really don't treat the... the pain piece, um, but I think that's a fine outcome. But I said it carefully, because I wanted to say that they're being well treated for both. They don't have overwhelming pain, their dosage of the medication isn't constantly going up, they're not diverting, they're doing well. And so that's not a bad outcome if they get two illnesses uh, treated by one medication. Well, I think we are at time, Dr. Westreich, so if everybody could give him some applause and thank him for his time.